know about the country situation. Inflation, starvation, insecurity, and the cherry on top, shady and messy politics. Now what do you picture yourself saying when you first talk to someone who says that they're from Venezuela? Surely you would say something like, oh, I'm sorry about your country situation. Did I guess that right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about my fellow Venezuelans, but there's always that one person who tries to pinpoint the blame of the situation at us because we chose our leaders, Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro. And to be honest, I do believe they're right, to some extent anyways. But did we do it purposefully? Did Venezuelans actually chose Hugo Chavez during his first term because we believe that his views for the country were what was best for our society? No. This happened because we were all misinformed. But what does this mean? What does being misinformed mean? Instead of giving you some generic dictionary definition, I'm just going to talk from my own experience. Being misinformed is lacking all the sufficient pieces of information in order to reach a conclusion or make a decision, either by a lack of information, wrongful interpretation of delivery, or just wrong facts. However, what does make us informed? If I were to ask you who won the 1977 Academy Award for Best Director, and you didn't know, and you probably don't, where would you recruit to? Now this is where my internal psychic comes into place. About 99% of you would answer Google, right? Of course, the internet. You would look it up, and a nice display of John B. Appleson's name will appear. There. Now you're informed. Thanks to the magic of the internet. However, is the, inter the internet the key to solving this problem, though? Well, a survey done by the Pew Research Center shows that about 87% of Americans that were surveyed believe that the internet has made them better informed in general, and 75% of them believe that the internet has made them better informed about politics. Now keep this figure in mind. It'll be useful later on. As shown like one minute ago, we have all come to rely on the internet whenever we need facts. We have an over-reliance on the first suggestion that Google suggests. Of course, it is the first page out of a million pages generated by Google, so we must have the best and the most information. Right? Well, I don't know about you, but I have been fooled by something that has been called fake news. I'm sure you have heard of it. This is where politicians and corporations take advantage of just how fast information in the internet can spread. In fact, just to paint a picture of just to what extent can information in the internet become the truth for several internet users, I'm going to use some research of my own. Yes, even in a TED talk, I'm able to get all science and stuff. Figures. So, some time ago, me and two other friends decided to ask ourselves a question. What if we could measure the rate at which something becomes viral in the internet? This is where the viral comes in. Very original name, I know. We decided to analyze news publications from news outlets' Facebook pages and categorize the news, as well as choose two newspapers from three different countries, Venezuela, USA, and Mexico. What we found is that news that were categorized as political tends to spread the most, the fastest, and have the most erratic and unpredictable behavior. In this context, this conclusion is dangerous, and this is why I asked you to keep the concept of internet politics in mind. Now, Coming back to the term fake news, I'm going to use a very popular subject and a favorite among audiences, Donald Trump. The 2016 presidential election has been popularized for its controversial run, and research done by the National Bureau of Economic Research shows that people tend to engage in the spread of fake news whenever it advances the motives of the political parties that they favor and downgrade those that they oppose. An example of this is that of a Romanian man who ran a site called EndingTheFed.com, which was actually responsible for four out of the top uh, Facebook articles that were denominated as fake news. This man, of course, supported Trump. And this gets even more alarming when we consider the fact that Trump supporters spread around 30 million articles that engaged in some way in fake news. In contrast, Clinton supporters only shared 8 million, which is still a lot, but you can see the contrast. People also tend to believe stories any story that supports the political candidates that they favor. This is when we understand the exploitation that uh, institutions and corporations get from our reliance on the internet. And the scariest thing is that ultimately, and when faced with a decision, people tend to judge their decisions based on the aspects that they're most familiar with, whenever they lack, they lack enough information or sources in order to be better informed. This is according to a 2011 study on the effects of ignorance on judgment and decision making. 
And coming back to Venezuelan politics, why did Hugo Chavez target his presidential campaign to a lower end of the Venezuelan society? Because he knew that they, well, didn't know better. They don't count with enough resources in order to logically evaluate options beyond his empty promises. Now, am I saying that impoverished people are ignorant by default? No, not at all. But let's face it, they don't count with their resources, but for example, we here at ASF do, to establish credibility and viability of information. But would this plot hole, let's call it, be solved by granting internet access to every single person in the world? Should the internet be considered a fundamental right? Well, as established before, everyone believes that the internet is a place where lots of information is stored. However, the information that is there is not always the most useful or accurate. If everyone in the world were to have access to this superlative amount of knowledge, the world would crash, let's say, of an information overload. It's like having an iPhone with too little storage and too many pictures, such as your 16 gigabyte iPhone. Apps start crashing, overheating, and unrelenting. Now imagine someone who has never been exposed to a minimal amount of knowledge suddenly having access to every single piece of information ever available to mankind. Would they be able to manage between valuable and non-valuable information, true or false? Your phone isn't able to make the distinction between what photos are essential for your safekeeping and which ones are not. They all amount to the same amount of storage. Now this brings up a very interesting phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is basically the ignorance of our ignorance. We tend to believe that we're more intelligent than we actually are. Now this is directly related to another effect called the Google effect. Now does anyone remember the name of the recipient for the 1977 Academy Award for Best Director? Some of you, most of you didn't, if you do, impressive, even I don't at this point. Well, this has to do with the fact that a 2011 experiment found that our brain recognizes the need, the, that there is less need to store information that we know is easily retrieved. The Google effect describes the, forget, the forgetting information that is easily found in the internet, which is everything. So have we actually become more intelligent, or have we been dumbed down by the over-reliance on the magic Google search bar? Now, let's look at a hypothetical situation. Let's imagine that every single government in the world were, were to give free and unlimited internet access to every single one of its citizens. How would the actual real world be example? How would social hierarchies, for example, be example, they'd be affected? We tend to believe, and we will not be wrong, that people who are the poorest tend to be prone to being more ignorant, to having less access to information. In a lot of cases, that's true. And of course, we're assuming that if the internet were to become a right, this problem will be easily solved. However, could this actually change their socioeconomic status? Maybe, maybe. Because let's not forget the fact that beyond being an information dump, the internet is actually a communication network that helps connect people who need them with those in need. However, I'll be using this statement as guidance every time I need to answer this question. Ignorance comes from how you use the internet, not how much you use the internet. If you have never been able to manage all the information that is found in the World Wide Web, then the internet as a solution for misinformation actually, ironically, helps to proliferate it. We may end up with a bunch of new riches who have all the power and money to propitiate change, but do so for a faulty purpose. And talking about riches, let's look at the economy. How will the economy be impacted? I'm sure, no, I'm certain, all of you know what Amazon is. A paradise for your shopaholic tendencies and one who sparks raw fear in your wallet. Well, it is estimated that by 2025, total retail sales for online commerce will account for 20%. Now, of course, it's not only Amazon, but all online shopping venues that are just waiting there for you to have your next anxiety attack and relax by making some irresponsible choices. Well, but what's the, what does 20% actually look like? Those of us who are already 15 years old have already completed 20% of our lives, we consider the average Mexican lifespan. I know, we're getting old. No, but it does seem like a, long, like a lot, right? 15 long and painful years. And if we consider the fact that the first online transaction was done as late as 1994, and then only in 2018, online commerce accounted for 14.3% of all retail sales, that would mean a 15% increase in just seven years. That would mean like growing 11 years in seven years, which does not make any sense, but that's the analogy I decided to use for this section. I'm sorry. <laughs> but going back to the economy, the rising prominence of e-commerce would surely mean the laying out of retail workers and physical workspaces. Research done by the National Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that between 2018 and 2028, 
around 105,000 million wor uh, thousand, thousand workers will be laid off the industry. That's 100,000 people that may I add did not need to have high school requirements in order to be given a job. How would they get another job if physical workspaces are reducing and they, they didn't have any for formal education? The economy would truly collapse. Well then, what's the verdict? Even though I think I've made myself pretty clear up to this point. Well, it seems to be a given that anyone who has access to the unlimited amount of information that, that is found on the internet has an unlimited supply of knowledge. However, as long as there is a spread of fake news and just misinformed sources, people will still be driven to make decisions based, based on wrong and missing facts. The, in, the, the world, its economy, and society are just not ready to have this happen. And ultimately, it's up to us whether we can and we need to have the internet to be worldwide. But personally, I don't think this will ever happen. Some people, some governments just thrive in having their people uncommunicated and misinformed so they can retain the power. Just look at the example from Venezuela. But should this be, I think it's everyone's right to have knowledge. The knowledge to make decisions that will turn their lives for the better. And now I'm gonna get all motivational and stuff. Yes, I'm giving you the full TED experience here. A little bit of history, a little bit of knowledge, and a little bit of inspiration. I want to end with this. Knowledge is power. Nah, too cliche, right? But this phrase is also wrong. You see, knowledge is knowledge, as long as you don't do anything with it. Their real power comes from being able to use knowledge in a righteous way. And of course, I would not be able to sleep at night if I knew I didn't say, thanks for coming to my TEDx talk.